Hey, welcome everyone. This is Ned from Caspio. Welcome to another episode of Caspio Labs. Uh, before I begin, as always, somebody do me a quick favor. Let me know that you can hear me okay in the chat window and we can go ahead and proceed. So if you are able to hear me, please let me know and we will go ahead and begin today's live stream. And also let me know if you can see my screen okay. I am sharing my screen at the moment. Hey Jonas, loud and clear, Ramil, welcome guys. Welcome to another episode of Caspio Labs. Uh, just a quick heads up before I begin. Uh, I don't know if you guys are affected. I live here in no uh, Northern California and we are having some really bad weather here in the recent last two days. Uh, last night I lost power for three hours here in our neighborhood. Uh, almost 4,000 homes were affected by this. And then this morning I also lost power for one hour. So if our live stream gets cut short today and it ends abruptly, just know that it's not really on my end. It's uh, out of my hands. Yeah, we're going to have another power outage. Hopefully that doesn't happen. Um, I really hope that we can get through today's live stream without any issues uh, on our end. Um, yeah, really, really bad. And where I used to live, actually in the Bay Area, I was looking at some videos that went viral, um, looking at the freeways near San Francisco. Um, the water level is so high that the cars are almost halfway submerged in water, which is, in which is really, really intense. I'm just happy I don't have to commute these days. I was looking at these videos and I couldn't believe that the freeway is almost, you know, the water level is, I would say, about three or four feet deep, you know, and cars are just barely moving. So the 49er game, yeah, it's it's pretty intense. And then on the Bay Bridge, another video surfaced uh, where the bed of the semi-truck completely shifted to the side and blocked the entire entire bridge. And I would hate to be the person stuck in that position because... I already have a fear of heights. I don't want to be stuck on the, on the bridge behind a semi and have to wait that out. Um, but yeah, so unfortunately, if anything happens in my end, just know that it is due to power outage. It's out of my hands and there's nothing I can do about that. Hopefully you guys are having a good Monday. Uh, let's go and dive right into our live stream. Yeah, what, we, what haven't we seen this year and also the past year? You know, we've had thunderstorms, we've had um, fires, we've had COVID, we still have COVID, and, you know, it's just one thing after another, you know. <laughs> I've never seen this kind of weather in the last, I mean, I've lived in the Bay Area for 20 years. I have never seen anything like this before. So hopefully things calm down a little bit on that front, at least on the weather. Um, but we can't really control that, right? Mother Nature gives us what it gives us. All right, so let's begin today's live stream. All right, today we're going to talk about um, formula data type and how it can be effective when we're doing calculations on the table level. And as you can see my table here, I have listed the formula data type quite a few times, and I'm going to be showing you a few examples of how formula data type can be used. We're not going to cover every single expression on the formula side, just because some of these I think are very, very rarely used. Uh, I can't even find a good use case for them. And I'm just going to cover a lot of the ones that I'm familiar with and I think are, you know, beneficial to your applications as well. And we're going to work our way top to bottom. And I'll try to explain exactly what I've done in my table. All of the examples are in one table, as you can see. I thought this would be the best way to effectively show you how each formula data type actually works in this case. So a lot of you are familiar with having a unique ID at the very top. I'm using an auto number data type. You can also use random ID or GUID. So that's very common to see in a table. It's a primary key. I showed this one quite a bit in my training classes and I thought that it would be beneficial to show it here as well. But if your tables have names, for example, first name, last name, and a full name, I always recommend that you have it set up this way. First name by itself, last name by itself, and then the full name, which concatenates both the first and last name together into its own field. And there are two ways that you can do that. One way, let me show you the formula if I click edit, is to include the first name. So you're going to select your first name. Then you're going to write plus space in parentheses one and another plus, and then the last name. This is going to create a space between your first and last name. That's one method. The second method that you can use, let's take a look at this formula data type. This is the one that I commonly use because it's a little bit faster in my opinion. We just add a plus sign, apostrophe, space, apostrophe, plus sign, and then the last name. This is also going to 
create the space between your first and last name. So both methods will work just fine. Then I added a field called phone, and then I have a composite key. Composite key essentially is multiple values from multiple fields combined into its own field. So now you're going to see how I take the first character of, of somebody's first name, combine that with the last name, and combine that with the last four digits of somebody's phone number. I call it a composite key. You can also call that a username if you'd like, and it can also be used to avoid duplicates. So if somebody is signing up and they use the same name, same last name, and the same phone number, you can reject that second entry because it already exists in the table. Just set it as a unique field. So like looking at my formula, we're going to use the expression text. So if you look at this one here called left, if you, lead the, if you read the brief description underneath, it just says returns the left part of the character string with a specified number of characters. Basically, starting from the left, we're going to include our field, that's ABC, that's the field name, comma two, and that's going to grab if, if you leave it as two, it's going to grab first two characters of that field, starting from the left side. So if you can see here, left, field name, comma one, that's going to return the first characters of somebody's first name, starting from the left. Then plus the last name field, and then plus right, phone number, four, which means starting from the right side, that's also another text expression that you can use. So if I scroll down a little bit, you're going to find right. So it starts on the right side, and it grabs the four. So looking at my example here under data sheet tab, there is my composite key and you can see the N first character combined that with the last name and then the last four digits of the uh, phone number. If I add one more example here, let's say uh, Jensen Wong and let's add the phone number here, something random and I click underneath that. Actually I have to add um, there was something else that I need to add because I have another one that's actually unique here. Forgot which one I need to add here uh, in order to create that unique field. Uh, it's supposed to combine the first and last name together with the phone number, but I have another one that's unique. That's the reason why it's not letting me do that at the moment. Avoid duplicates. Let me go ahead and just refresh the browser here for a second. Uh, it's the avoid duplicates. Okay, so this is the one that I also have to enter. I'll explain this formula later, but let me add that for right now. Okay, so let's try that one more time. We'll say Jensen. Jensen Wong. 565, 565, 565. And then I need to enter this here as well. And then I'll explain this in just later today. All right. So now you can see when you make that entry, we have the full name combined. It's, does, it's doing the same thing. And then here's my composite key. Only look at this one for now, okay? Here's my composite key. And then we have jwong5656, okay? Very helpful if you're doing like a username field or if you want to reject duplicates. The second one, I have almost the same exact thing with a minor difference, okay? So if I look at this formula, Once again, I'm doing the same thing in the beginning. I'm grabbing one character from somebody's first name starting from the left. I'm combining that with the last name. And now I'm converting to a variable character or varchar the user ID. My user ID is an auto number. It's an integer. So I need to convert that to a variable character because variable character can support any kind of a character. It can be a number. It can be an integer. It can be text. It can be a symbol. And all we need to do with that is we need to convert that to a variable character. That's really all we're doing in order to use that user ID inside this um, username field that I've created. So if you're going to do something like that, you have to use plus convert, varchar, comma, and then the user ID field. If this is just a text 255, then you don't have to use convert varchar. You can just use the field as it is. But if it's an auto number, if it's a random ID, global unique identifier, or if it's a prefixed auto number, you have to use that in order to convert it, okay? So you'll see now in my data sheet tab, Jensen is ID number six, J Wong six. It just combines all of those values together as a username, okay? Let's move on. Another example that I'm using here is to avoid duplicates. This is very helpful if you have a many-to-many -many setup. A many-to-many -many has two parent tables. In this case, we have a table of students 
we have a table of classrooms and we're gonna have a joining table between them where we can check to see if the same students sign up for the same classroom more than once. And that allows us to avoid duplicates. So for example, uh, let's just say Jensen Wong student ID is 111, classroom ID is 258. If we mistakenly try to add Jensen to the same classroom once again, so let's just use maybe a different name so it's maybe a little bit clearer. We'll just say Tom Smith, uh, phone number, something, again, something random. And let's say Tom is also ID 111, and we try to submit Tom to the same classroom. It's not going to let me submit that entry because it's going to avoid duplicates, okay? Because we already have this inside a table, and this will prevent me from adding the same student to the same classroom more than once. This is very helpful if you're doing a many-to-many -to, -many to avoid having the same entry submitted more than once into a joining table, okay? Let's come back here. Uh, I mean, let me just change this to something else so that we can add that to my table. All right, let's move on to the other ones that we have here. Next example we're going to look at is something a little bit more complicated where we calculate the monthly mortgage payment. Okay, so if you ever purchased a, car, uh, a house, let's say your principal amount or a mortgage amount is $650,000, you are paying that house over 30 years at an interest of 2.9, you want to be able to calculate the monthly payment for your mortgage, how much you're going to end up paying. So we have the mortgage amount, we have the number of years, and we have the interest rate, and then we're going to calculate the monthly payment. Now this formula, it looks a little bit complicated, but it's really not. Let me move it here from the left. Here's what the formula we're going to be using. Let me see if I can move this here to the left so that you can see the formula and what I've done. you got to be able to find a way to translate this formula into what you see here on this screen. Okay, And I'm going to walk you guys through these steps one at a time so that you understand what I did here. So this is your monthly mortgage payment that you're calculating. This is your principal amount or the mortgage amount, which is at the very beginning. For now, just ignore is null. I'll explain what is null does in just a moment, but ignore that for now, okay? Mortgage amount, which is this P here that you're seeing, times, and then you have to calculate this value here that's going to be in between the parentheses. So you open up the parentheses because we need to calculate this times the principal amount. You're going to take the interest rate, okay, which is the little r, and you want to calculate that, you want to actually express that in monthly instead of annual interest. You want a monthly interest rate. And to calculate the monthly interest rate, you have to divide that by 1,200. Okay, so you take the interest rate, which is something that we have. So let me move this over here to the left. We have the interest rate. Usually it's added as 2.9 or 3.0, depending on the interest rate. We're going to divide that by 1,200 times and then to the power of the number of months. Okay, so we have a power expression that you can use under math. So if you go down here to the bottom, you're going to find power. And the way you want to look at this is you're going to take the field, comma 1. After the comma 1, that's the number to the power of, right? So that's going to be the number of months that we need to calculate. So let me bring back my formula. Okay, so if you look here, power 1 plus, so there's the 1 plus. Once again, we need to calculate the rate. So that's going to be interest rate divided by 1,200, and then the comma, and after the comma is to the power of. Now, we have years, so it can be a 15-year loan, it could be a 30-year loan, but we want to times that by 12 so that we can get the number of months. So if it's 30 years, that's going to be 360. So that's going to be to the power of 360. So you calculate that value, and then you divide that by, so you're dividing that by this value underneath, which is almost identical, right? So you take the power, 1 plus the interest rate, comma, number of months, you close the parentheses, and then you minus 1 here. And then you close the entire parentheses, all of this entire calculation. And that's going to calculate the monthly mortgage payment for you. Is null is used, if it returns a blank value or nothing, it's going to substitute that as a 0. Okay? So if nothing gets returned in that cell, make sure you add a 0. Okay? So let's try this out. Hit Apply, Data Sheet tab. Let me add for my existing data entries that we have. Let's just say value of the house is 800000 uh, You're paying that over 30 years and interest rate 2.9. Okay, there's my calculation. Let me just scroll to the right a little bit. That's the monthly payment. And now I'm going to show you how to calculate the interest paid. So over 30 years, at this interest rate, how do we get this amount? 
That's what you end up paying for interest over 30 years, 360 months. And that calculation is actually very simple. So let's take a look at our uh, interest paid. Basically, we are reusing the same formula that we used to calculate the monthly payment at the very beginning. So that's the same exact formula up until this point here. So this is the same exact formula that we just looked at to calculate the monthly payment. Now, one thing I will mention here on the table level, we cannot use nested values. But on the data page side, when you use the calculated field, we can use an actual nested value to not have to reproduce this formula again. Okay, so I had to copy my formula from here and paste it all over here. You don't have to do that when you're actually building a form or building a report because you can reuse that calculated value as a nested value inside your equation. Okay, you want to times that by 360 months in this case, and then you subtract the mortgage amount. Okay, so in other words, let's come over here. Scroll to the right a little bit so that we can see it. You're going to take that amount, times that by 360. That's the number of months. Okay, and then you subtract 800,000, and that's the number that you're going to get. Let's just check to make sure our formula is working correctly. So we're going to take 3329, let's just round it, times 360. Okay, minus 800,000. That's going to give us about approximately 398,742 because I rounded it. I didn't actually use all of the digits after the decimal. Okay. Let me know if you have any questions so far. Hopefully, hopefully this is all making sense in terms of these formula data types that I'm showing you before we move on to the next ones. Has anyone used any of these that I'm showing you so far? If you have, let me know. Yeah, okay, good. Thank you, Northwest. Let's move right along. All right, so upper first name. So using the upper expression, okay? So let's take a look at this formula. This one is also fairly simple. It's under text you're going to find some, something called upper. And it just converts anything that's lowercase into uppercase. Okay, and I'm using my first name field, and sometimes people like to turn all of their submissions into uppercase, you know, whatever the reason may be, so that you can see it on the report. Maybe it's a little bit clearer. Okay, so if I do that, and I come over here, you will see under first name for upper, how I converted the first name in all uppercase. I can do the same thing for my username if I wanted to. So say, for example, I come back to the username field. Okay, let's just say we use upper at the very beginning here. So we'll just say, there's my upper, there it is. Close that, wrap that whole thing in upper, verify formula, looks good, hit apply. And now you will see what happens to my table. Okay, the entire username is an uppercase. All right, let's move on. So that was upper, null if. And let's just take a look at this one. Let's just read the description together so that you can see. Where is null if? Thought that would be under. Oh, okay, here it is, null if. Returns the first expression if the two expressions are not equal. If the expressions are equal, it returns the null value. Okay, so if one field matches the other field, okay, it returns a null value. However, if the two expressions don't match, it's going to return the first value. Okay, so I'm using, as you can see, first name and last name in my example. Let me see if I have any that are the same. So, Brian Smith, it should return Brian, right? So let's come back over here and find it. Let me just find that field. 
okay, it returned Brian. But if first name equals to last name, it returns a blank entry. So Joe equals to Joe, you can see how it returns nothing, okay? So you might have a use case for that as well if you're comparing two. So if it one equals to the other, return nothing. If it's different, always return the first value, okay? All right, now let's take a look at the first name length, which is expression len. Let's take a look at this formula. So if we look at len, basically returns the length of the characters, how many you have inside that string, okay? So in my example, I'm using, again, I'm using the first name. So if you have a need for that, let's come over to that field, len. Okay, first name length, it re returns the number of characters for that field. And this is Ned, you can see the first name, this is Brian 5, okay, this is 3, Sarah is 5, Jensen is 6, Tom is 3, okay. Let's move on. Reverse. Reverse is also a simple one. You can probably guess what it does. It's just going to reverse the characters starting from the last to the first, as opposed to the first to the last. Okay, so looking at my phone number field here, let's go to data sheet. My phone numbers, you can see 333, and then in the end, 4433. It's going to reverse that. It's going to start with 4433, 333, and then 333. Let's come find it over here. And there it is. Just reverse. Okay, so if you have a need for a use case like that, that's all it does. All right, moving on. Substring. So substring counts from this starting position. So let's say, again, I'm looking at the first name. You start at the third character, and then you count twice after that. Okay, so let's take a look. This one's actually fairly simple as well. So you count to three, if that's what you put as the very first number, and then you count twice after that, because I'm using three and two. So it's going to return IA. Okay, here it's going to return RA. So if we go all the way to the right here, to find that, you will see IA, RA, and S. If I change that to something else, where's my substring? Let's say we want starting at number uh, character three from the left, and we let's return three more after that. Hit apply, hit save. Now it's going to return uh, Ian, IAN, RAH. And uh, S E N. So let's take a look. If I come over here, we should be able to see that N S C R A H E N I A N. So that's substring. Okay. Now let's take a look at some date expressions. So the first one we're going to look at is the date difference. Okay. So we have two date fields: date one and date two. This formula here is looking at a date difference month from day, date one to date two. Okay, so let's see what it does. Data sheet tab. Where is my date difference in month? So you can see it calculates how many months between the two dates. So if you put month or if you put year, it's going to calculate the number of years between the two dates. If you put month, it's going to calculate the number of months. And in this one, I'm actually doing a date difference in minutes. So it's also calculating in minutes those six months. And you're getting 244,800 minutes equivalent to, which is equivalent to six months, okay? So that expression, if I come over here for minute, if you want to do something like that, you put minute, comma, and then the two date fields. I've seen customers use this to calculate how many minutes or how many hours a person has worked on their date shift, on their shift. So if you want to do something like that, by the end of the week, you can calculate, you know, this person worked 40 hours this week, this person worked 50 hours, something like that. Uh, day of month, so let's take a look at this one. Just on the single field, I'm using date one, calculate the day. So let's take a look. Day of month, you will see 24. So it's just taking the day of that month. So it's grabbing that substring of that whole entire date, and it's just giving me the day of that month, which is 24. Okay, next we're going to look at is some case then statements, okay, 
case when then for comparison. So imagine in our table we have test scores for students and we have 80%, 77%, 99%, uh, and 55%. And we want to be able to assign a grade based on that test result. Okay, so we're going to look at the test grade. Let's take a look at this formula. It looks daunting, but it's really not. It's a very simple case expression. So case when the test score, which is this field over here, between 90 and 100, then return A. So if the test score is between 90 and 100, return A. Between these two values, return B. C, D, and F. Okay. When I was in school, I mostly hovered around this one here, this one here, and sometimes this one. So I was, I would say a B minus C plus and sometimes A minus student. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's go ahead and verify the formula. It looks good. All right. Let's cancel out of that and let's just see how it works. I think you already noticed from a moment ago, you can see that if returns 80, it's going to give us a B. If it returns 61%, it's going to return us a D. Maybe, I don't know about 71%, that should be a C. Now you can also get down to a granular level here. You can also define this if it's between 80 and 83, give me a, a B minus. If it's between 83 and 86, that's a B. 86 and 89, that's a B plus. Okay, you can return uh, different types of test grades based on the type of a test score basically. Okay, next we're gonna look at is how to calculate Okay, good, good, glad to see. A lot of people have not seen these YouTube videos. Um, so that's why I'm bringing back some of these into the live stream today. And also including a few other ones that maybe people haven't seen before. A lot of them are actually fairly simple to understand. Um, there isn't really that much to it. Next week, not next week, but the week after, we're going to talk about SQL on the data page side, which is going to get a little bit more complex. So in two weeks, we're going to do SQL on the data page side, where we use select statements, average, count, and different types of comparisons. That's going to be a little bit more technically challenging. Today, we're using the formula data type on the table level, which is a little bit limited. But in two weeks, we're going to cover SQL statements on the data page side. Next week, since I'm bringing up what we're going to be covering, next week, we're doing something a little bit more fun. We're going to use Unicode to gamify our applications. So how can we use emojis to spurse up the application so it looks visually appealing to the end user? Okay, and all the different ways of how you can inject Unicode inside the data pages to bring up, um, to make it more fun, okay? All right, let's move to the right here a little bit. Let's take a look at the Realtor Commission. So this formula, also looks a little bit daunting, but it's really not. Also uses case when. So if the mortgage amount, so looking at this field here, mortgage amount, so depending on what the house was sold for, okay, is between these two figures, then pay out the commission mortgage amount times 0 0.03, which is 3%. Give that realtor 3% commission if they sold a house between those two values. If the house is sold between these two values, well, don't incentivize it as much, pay them 2%. And finally, if it's between these two values, then give a commission of 1%. Okay, so if I hit apply and come over here, we have the mortgage amount, which is this one here. And it's already calculating. These four figures are already going to be calculated on the right side here. Let's add two more because we have six entries here. Why don't we do uh, 10 million? That's 1 million. Let me see. Hard to see. Okay, that's 1 million. That's 10 million. And let's also do 50,000. Okay, let's scroll to the right. And my commission is right over here. Okay, you can see this one was paid out a little bit more because it was 10 million. So we paid 3% on 10 million. That's going to give us uh, 300,000. That makes sense. Okay, and I thought that this one would get paid out too. Oh, it didn't get paid out because um, it was sold below the lowest amount that we're actually paying out the commission for. So that makes sense, right? So if I look at that, formula, we don't have 50,000. We have between 150,000 and 649,000. So that actually makes sense. Okay. 
All right, let's take a look at the absolute value. Absolute value, I never use it in my applications, but maybe you guys have a use case for it. It just returns a positive value. So if it's minus 12, it's going to come back as 12. Okay, anytime you have a negative result, it's always going to turn it into a positive result. That's really what it does, the absolute value. So if your equation calculates, not that it ever would, but let's say it calculates the commission to be minus 1,100, it's going to return that as 1,100. Okay, that's what the absolute value does, ABS. Uh, nearest integer, so let's take a look at this one. Okay, so math, ceiling. There's floor and there's ceiling, right? Rounds the number up to the nearest integer. So if you're looking at something, let's say, where do you go? 1.126. Nearest integer, you can see how it returns 2. If it's 1.126, it's just going to round it up to the nearest integer. Okay? Very, very simple. Nothing too complicated there. Let's take a look at the next one. Radiance to degrees. I don't know if you guys are ever going to have a need to do that, um, but it just calculates the radiance to degrees. If you look up the equation, this is a little bit past my pay grade uh, as far as math is concerned. So honestly, I still don't know what it does, but if you are converting radiance to degrees, I put in just a default value of 0.36. It returns this figure over here, 20.626. So let's just take a look. Radiance two degrees equation, which takes a look at one radian equals 180 um, something P zero. I don't know what it does, but I decided to include it anyway, just so that you can see it. Uh, it beats me what it's used for. Um, but if you guys know, hey, by all means, go ahead and use it in your applications, okay? And let's see, we only have a few more left. So let's take a look. Um, round one. All right, what am I doing here? What did I use here? So I used the uh, round. I think this is basically just rounding it. Let's see. Rounding number to a specified length of pre Oh, precision, right. So if you put comma 1, it's going to round it to the nearest tenth, I believe. So let's see. What am I calculating here, round 1? Let me go to data sheet tab. So let's come over here. Found round 1. I believe that I'm taking the commission or the monthly, oh no, it's the monthly mortgage, right? So if you're, if they returns monthly mortgage, something like this, look at this number, okay? And you want to round that to one digit after the decimal, you just put a comma one and it's going to round that to the nearest uh, one di digit after the decimal. So that's going to return 2705.5. So if I scroll to the right, you're going to see 2705.5. 2705.5. Okay, so that's what rounding allows you to do. And then square is pretty easy. You know, 8 times 8, it's going to give you a 64. So if you need a square, you know, it's just going to return, you know, that, that result. 8 times 8 is 64. 7 times 7 is 49, right? So if I come over here, you will see because I use 8, it's going to give you 64. But if I use square around this figure, it's going to take 2705.5 times 2705.5, and that's going to return a long number if you ever need to put your results in a square like that. And then square root is also very simple. Uh, square root, uh, if you use 16, it's going to return 4 because the square root of 16 is 4. 4 times 4 is 16. If you use 9, it's going to return 3. In this case, I'm using 10, so it's going to be a little more precise, it's going to be 3.1, something like that. So if I come over here to data sheet tab and I scroll to the right, you will see 3.116. Okay. Like I said, a lot of these um, formulas that we have, you may not even need to use them. For example, I've never used um, a co uh, R cosine, I've never used a sine, I've never used tangent. These ones I've never really used. I and yet to find a use case for these types of functions. Um, if you guys have used it, please share that with the chat. Uh, I would love to see how you guys are using these other types of functions.
but mostly I use some basic math functions. I've used a lot of text for uh, string manipulation. So if I'm grabbing characters from one field and I want to combine that with another field, I've done that. And I've also done date functions as well. Okay. But as if you noticed in my in my live stream today, we can use case then if case uh, case when uh, then type statements inside the um, the window here. Okay, so you can do that as well. And I'm going to show you an example of that how we can use it on the data page side in two weeks. Okay, which is pretty cool actually, especially when you combine it with these Unicodes uh, that we're going to use uh, for emojis. All right. So as I predicted, today's live stream was not going to take a full hour. Hopefully you guys enjoyed today's live stream. Uh, we did cover a lot of the data, um, a lot of formula data type functions inside today's live stream. Uh, let me take a look at your questions, see if I missed anything. And hopefully I'll see you guys next week. Next week is going to be fun. We're going to be using the Unicode uh, to display on the data page side and all the different ways of how we can inject that inside the reports and also submission forms. Um, well, let me take a look, see what I missed. Thank you, Stability. I appreciate that feedback. What does the smileys do in the formula edit window? Formula edit window, the smileys. Um, let's save it for next week. We may not use the actual Unicode here. We might, we'll see. But most of it will be used inside the data page side, not on the table level. Okay. Can we use SQL and formulas in tables? Only certain expressions can be used in the, on, a, on the table side. But I will cover a variety of other options on SQL on the data page side in two weeks. Okay, where we use select sum, select count, select average. Uh, you'll see a lot more options in two weeks and how we can use the SQL on the data page side. And I've done it so many times to create really nice dashboards. So if I look at, let's say, this example here, um, sales dashboard, how you can calculate values here in the dashboard. Okay, and this is just data being pulled from the Caspio table, okay, from the entire table. And you can also do conditional where sales status equals to pending or something like that. Only calculates the data that's pending, not all of the data from within the table. Okay. So is there a workaround to combine formulas? Formula output is 5 multiplied by another formula 10 equals 50. Yes, on the data page side. So you can do that on the data page side. Unfortunately, you cannot combine them on the table side. Okay, but on the data page side, you will see how we can do that. And that's going to be in about two weeks. What does the smileys do in the formula edit window? Comes when you hit verify formula. I think it's going to give you an in the invalid formula. I'll be honest with you. I haven't really tested it yet, Brian. It's a good question. Um, we might have to convert that into a var chart variable character because Unicode has a lot of different symbols. You'll have an ampersand. You'll have a hashtag. You'll have different uh, numbers to identify that Unicode. Emoji. So the idea here uh, for next week, so let's take a Unicode code emojis. So you will see how we can use these Unicodes here, these codes, and how we can inject them in the data page side to return these emojis. If you guys are investing, which is a pretty cool idea, if you're investing and you're building some kind of a financial application, you want to show diamond hands. Um, you can return two diamonds or something like that, or two hands, you know, like this for holding, holding a stock, you know, something like that. So that's an idea on how you can use Unicode to return emojis to gamify it. But more on this next week, you know, but this is the idea and what we're going to be talking about. And all the different places where you can actually put the Unicode in the data page wizard. Okay. Uh, do you have the videos from your construction of the sales dashboard? So this one here, I do not, not this specific one, but I have done that in the past. Let me go ahead and pull that up. I have a very similar video on our YouTube channel. Um, 
Caspio dashboard. Let me pull that up for you really quickly. Maybe you haven't seen this one yet, but creating a web dashboard from Excel. So check out this video. You have, oh, I have the others. Okay, so maybe you've seen this one already. But they all follow the same concept. You know, I may use a few charts. I may use a tabular report, maybe a pivot table, and then just a couple of SQL expressions uh, to pull data from the table. If I'm doing a sum or if I'm doing an average. Uh, but we will cover a variety of them in two weeks. Uh, yeah, you will see quite a few. Thank you. Do you have the video? Okay. No, no. When you verify this video, it comes in the low right corner. When you verify in this video, it comes in the lower right corner. Sorry, Brian. I'm not following you on that one, Brian. No, no. When you verify in the video, it comes in the low right corner. Will you ever have an in-person conference and training? Maybe. Uh, we might have that. It's, now it's a little bit more complicated and tricky because of COVID. So uh, precautions, there are lots of precautions here that we would probably have to look at before we can do something like that. We did have it before, before the pandemic, but nowadays uh, I think it's a little more feasible to do it over, over a live stream or web, web type training. But, you know, if things return back to normal or somewhat to normal, then yes, we can look into the possibility of reopening that and having it in person, where we either go to you or you can come to us. Verify a formula, let me come back here. So you're saying if I verify the formula, it looks valid. Party time, yeah, yeah, definitely. Especially if you guys come over here, yeah. We can definitely uh, have fun, we can go out and get some lunch. You know, brainstorm and talk about the application if it even comes up. You know. <laughs> hey, Brian, if there's a follow-up on that, definitely let me know um, on the Verify Formula button. Uh, I'm not 100% sure. If you want to take that offline, Brian, we can, or you can check with our support team on that as well. Some formulas give us, oh, you're talking about this. No, this is Grammarly. Sorry, I have Grammarly connected to my browser on Chrome, so it checks for my spelling and things like that. So that's, that's a built-in to my browser. Okay, so if you guys want Grammarly, too, to check for your spelling and things like that, you can, uh, you can add it as an add-on app to your browser, and then it just automatically checks. As you're typing, it checks for all of the spelling and things like that. That's not a Caspio thing. Sorry about that. I should have realized that when you said it. Say if you type in, uh, let's just say we make a mistake. We is going to lunch today. Okay, it found two mistakes. And then you open Grammarly and it shows you what mistakes you made. So you can fix that. We are. And now it's green. No mistakes. And that's free. You guys can install that to your browser as well if you guys want something like that. I have the free version. I don't have the premium account. So, But very helpful. Very extremely helpful. You can connect it to your Outlook. You can connect it to your Word document. Okay. And as you can see, you can connect to your Caspio account as well. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys, for attending today's live stream. I really, again, for those of you who keep coming back, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Hopefully you enjoyed today's session. It will be available on our YouTube channel later today, so you guys can watch this video at a later time. And I hope to see many of you again come back next week. Uh, I'm, always, I'm always open to suggestions. If you guys have an idea or a topic you want to bring up to the live stream, let me know ahead of time, and I can definitely try to incorporate that into our future live streams. I would be more than happy to do that, okay, if it makes sense and if, it, if the time permits. All right, with that, I will end the stream now. I will keep the chat open, going for a few more minutes. If you guys have any more questions, and uh, yeah, hope to see you again next week. Stay safe. 
And I'm just, again, I'm thankful that we didn't have a power outage during the live stream. So very happy about that. Can we use the select statement in the table level to retrieve data from another table? You cannot. So unfortunately, the select statement will not work on the table level. Uh, the table level only is compatible with scalar type expressions, which is one column in one row. Uh, but on the data page side, we can definitely do that. And in two weeks, I will show you how you can use the select statement on the data page side to pull and retrieve data from another table. Okay, and we use a calculated field to accomplish that. All right, thanks, guys. Have a good day. I'll see you next week.